this in an ally. I'm, I'm changing my strategy here. And then a style I'll do. Um, I'll make the background yellow and the color red and the font size um, larger. properties. I typically like to use the, the web technology, so I, I don't like to bury it in the .NET code. Um, that, that's my preference, but yeah, you could, you could set the properties um, for other easy ways to change. Really. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like if I went in, for example, and set, a, uh, set the background color of this to be red, all right, if I added another control, I'd have to go in and do the same thing. Doing it this way, all I have to do is go and um, make sure it has the same CSS class assigned to it. And if it does, you know, then I'm in business. All right. So let's run this and see if it works. Okay. Sure what that means. Let's go and stop debugging and run this again. How did I get in this mode? Full screen. There we go. All right. So if I don't put anything in, there we go. It's in the LI. You must enter a temperature, and it's styled the way that I want it to. All right. Oh. You didn't, you didn't set any pro, um, location values for that, did you? So it just well, no. I made I made it I made it an LI, so I know that it would line up nice. So it just automatically nice down goes the line. to the next. Yeah. All right. Now we could do a similar thing with, or, or let's back up. That catches if nothing is entered. It does not catch if I enter garbage in. And I still get my error. So I have to put another validator in for that. So I'll do a similar thing. I'll go and put in, though, a compare validator. All right. You could actually do this a couple different ways. Right. The compare validator checks for data types, among other things. It also compares to see if two controls are equal or if one control is greater than another control and so on. All right. So I could do a compare validator and check to make sure that I'm putting a number in there. And that's what I'm going to do in this case. The other thing I could do is if there was a valid range of temperatures, you know, if I wanted to make sure that, that, that you didn't put a number higher than 500 or lower than negative 500, all right, I could put in a range validator and say the top range is 500, the bottom range is negative 500. But I think I did an example of that one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in oops, a compare validator. All right. And I will say must enter number. For my error 
message. I will scroll down. The control to validate is text temperature. What control do I want to, or what, uh, what sort of, uh, what sort of um, comparison do I want to do? I want to do a data type check. So I pick under operator data type check. And lastly, what's the type of the field? It's a double. One little trick I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a dynamic as a display type. What that will do is that will allow it to sort of slide over if the other validation error message isn't there. Let me show you what I mean instead of telling you what I mean. I'll, I'll leave it as static and we'll show, we'll show what happens. The one thing I want to do though is I want to go and I want to put air temp as the CSS class for this guy too. Alright? So, now let's run this and see what happens. If I go in and I put nothing in here, I get my, my you must enter a temperature. If I put in garbage here, I get you must enter a number. But notice how it's like next to where that other message would appear if it's displaying. Now I kind of don't like that. You might like that, you might not like that, whatever. All right. What I would like to have happen is I want that first error message not to take up any space unless there actually is an error, right? So what I can do for that is I can go and set the display type for that first validator to dynamic. And what that means is it will only take up space if that error message appears. If it doesn't appear, it won't take up any space and it won't mess up my alignment. So let's go in here and run this, and now if I type garbage in here, I get that. If I type, or if I type nothing in there, I get that. If I type garbage in, I get that, and it just, it lines up in the same place the error messages, which is, which is the way I would have envisioned it, so I'm pretty happy. Could you do that first? Will the other error show up to the right of that yellow box still? There were two types of errors. Yeah, this this is a second error. Oh, right? so it is kicked So it is, it is kicked over, time. right, oh. because I made the first one say display type dynamic. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's make sure we understand the form cycle. All right, blank form loads. User fills in data, or maybe forgets to fill in the data. Presses submit. In normal circumstances, the validation controls will fire off JavaScript code on the client side. All right? Why? Because that's a win-win situation, right? If the data is bad, why send it to the server for processing? It's going to put an extra burden on the server, and it's going to give, uh, it's going to cause the, the client to, to experience a delay while the data is sent to the server and the response comes back from the server. So, in a normal environment, when you click submit, those validation controls fire off as client-side JavaScript and will produce the output depending on the error message. All right? Therefore, it hasn't made it back to the server yet as I'm running through these errors. All right? When I finally put in a valid value, the validators fire off. Notices that there are no problems, and then the server is called. The server does its thing, produces the results, redisplays the page, and all the controls have the, the same values. They remember what values they had. So unless we've changed it somehow through the code, that text box will still have a value that we, we entered it in. Yes? Is there any way to see the JavaScript? Um, yeah. It won't be terribly meaningful, perhaps, but we can see the JavaScript that it generates. I was just thinking, because if it's 
it's going to be done before it's sent to the server, then the server's going to post back a web page. It wouldn't have the uh, JavaScript in it because it doesn't need it anymore, would it? Well, yeah, it needs it because I could put another value in, right? Okay. Yeah. So it has to be delivered. And if you do a view source, you can see the JavaScript. But again, it doesn't look like it's terribly, terribly meaningful. If you look, it's actually pointing to temperature web resource dot axd question mark d equals blah 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 blah. All right. So again, yeah, it's there, but it, it, it's not um, something that's terribly meaningful. Okay, so as soon as you drag that validation control in, it pops that code in. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now. Notice I said in the last couple examples, under normal circumstances, this is what would happen. What do I mean by normal circumstances? What would be an example of abnormal circumstances in the scenario that I described? You want to run the validation on the server? Not that you wanted to run the validation on the server, but what if the client had JavaScript disabled? and the validation couldn't run on the client because JavaScript is disabled. Well, the good news is that the validation actually runs on the client and on the server. If it can't run on the client, the server will catch the validation and will display the error. So that's, that's a good thing. Now, the bad thing, or not, it's not really a bad thing, but it's just something to consider is it's going to still try and do, even though it displays the validation errors, it's still going to try to do that button submit event. So it'll catch those errors, but the submit is going to continue. There's nothing like in JavaScript automatically where it backs out submitting if it notices an error. So we have to insert one line of code into our code behind event that should be in all your code behinds for processing a button click. And that line of code is pretty simple. And it would look like this. If is valid. All that simply says is, hey, if all the validations pass, then do this code. If the validations didn't pass, don't bother trying to do the calculation. <laughs> the only reason you need to put this code in there is because your client could have uh, JavaScript disabled, which means that even though there's invalid data, it could get submitted to the server. So you have to tell the server, hey, wait a minute, if the data is not valid, then don't try to do any more. So you can almost just do that automatically. All of your uh, button click events, all of, the, all of the submit events, can just have an is valid wrapped around everything. And if it's not valid, then don't bother. <coughs> oh, yes? Can you run through that second validator one more time? The second yeah, validator? Yeah, the compare validator? Sure. Thank you. All right, let's look at the compare validator. <coughs> all right. The properties I set for it, first of all, I set the CSS class because I want it to look the same. I set the error message, must enter a number. I have to assign the control to validate. Every validator, uh, every validator has at least one control that is validating, right? So for every validator, there's a property control to validate, and that's the control that you want to validate. And in this case, it's the temperature. The operator is the kind of validation that we want to perform. And we can perform equal, not equal, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to or a date type check. In this particular case, we want to do a date type check because um, 
we want to make sure that, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm saying date type check. It should be data type check. We want to do a data type check, check because we want to make sure that there's a number in that field. All right. In lab two, you probably should have had one of these validators that did an equal check, right, to make sure password one equal password two. Or if you had a date range, let's say, you were entering in a starting date and an ending date that you wanted to do a query on, then you'd want to make sure the start date was before the ending date. All right. In any of those cases, additionally, you'll have the control to compare to. But with a data type check, you don't have a control to uh, compare to. The last thing is you have to identify the type that you want to do the data type check for. So uh, I'm checking the type of this data. The control I'm checking is text temperature. And by the way, what should be in there is a double. All right. So that, uh, in essence, is that. So that type should be what you declared in the statement? That's what I'm, that's whatever I'm expecting, yeah, and, and yeah, uh, I, I suppose that's a good rule of thumb. In other words, if I declared, if I'm going to put that value, I'm going to put that value in a double, then I should be validating this a double, right? If I was putting it in an integer, let's say, let's say you had to put in a whole, te whole number for, for the temperature, uh, then yeah, I'd do a validation to make sure it was an was a integer. Otherwise, I could get... Um, potentially misleading results. All right, questions. Let's go in now and let's let's make this actually, let's do a better job and actually do um, the conversion either way. In other words, right now we're doing from Fahrenheit to centigrade, let's do from centigrade to Fahrenheit. And we decided when we designed this that we're going to use a drop-down to, to indicate the type of conversion. All right? So that's, that's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll do that in there. So we have to, first of all, add our options to that. All right? We have to add the options that we want to do. And then we have to do, uh, you know, put, uh, uh, put, change our code behind to take that into account. The other thing we're going to do, let's say, is we're going to clean up that label a little bit. So I'm going to start by blanking out the text that's already there. All right. Now, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to edit items. And in this case, I'm not pulling from a database or anything the options. The options are just, you know, essentially hard-coded options. I have two choices, Fahrenheit to centigrade, centigrade to Fahrenheit. So I click Add to add an option. And remember, when I add an option, and this holds true, by the way, for radio buttons as well, because we could do the same code with a radio button group instead of a dropdown, but we chose to do it as a dropdown. For any of these controls, there's a text. For each item, there's a text and there's a value. The text is what the user sees, so it should be something that's intelligible to the user. So, I'm going to type in Fahrenheit to centigrade. All right. And by default, it makes the value the same thing as the text, but it doesn't have to be. I'm going to make the value of this F to C. All right. So that's the first item. The script is going to see the value. The user is going to see the text. So the script should be something, or I'm sorry, the text should be something that the, uh, is going to be intelligible to a user. The value is going to be what the script sees. So it doesn't have to be intelligible to the user. So now we have those two values in there, all right? What we have to do is we have to go and um, deal with this in, in, in 
leaving our code behind, right? Because we don't always want to do that same equation. We want to sometimes do one equation, sometimes do the other equation. So let's look at the code behind. All right. Part of this is going to stay the same, right? In other words, I still need to grab the temperature from the text box, all right, regardless of what conversion I do. This line here is going to be different. And for now, anyhow, yeah, that's going to be the same. All right, we might go and pretty up that output in, in a few minutes here. But for right now, we can leave that part the same. Remember, we don't have to hit a home run. We don't have to do everything in one shot. We can do it incrementally. All right, so... What I want to do now is I want the program to choose which instruction to do. Because this is the instruction, and I'm going to be a, a good egg and put program uh, comments in here. And I will say convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. I can write a statement that says convert centigrade to Fahrenheit, and the formula would look something like this, dbl result equals I think that's the right formula, but we'll test it out. All right. But we have to put code in to allow the server to choose which one of those two equations to do. Well, how is, how, how is the, the server to choose which equation to do based on the value in the dropdown? So therefore, I'm going to say if and again, I have to refer to that drop-down control. What's the name of the drop-down control? Well, it's drop-down conversion. That's the name I gave it when I created it the other day. So, I will say if drop-down conversion... Now again, that drop-down is a component. It's a control. It's an object. Therefore, there's a bunch of properties associated with the drop-down, right? There's a position, the call, all those things that we talked about before. What property are we interested in? Now, here's where I'll make a slight disclaimer, all right? Um, I can't possibly teach you all the properties for all the controls. And you will never remember all the properties for all the controls. Now, you might know this property, you might not. All right. The value for a drop-down, you will learn pretty quickly, right? because it's a common, commonly used property. But, let's say, for the sake of argument, you don't know what the correct property is. All right. What you have to get good at, all right, part of the game here, is being able to look at the control and identify the right property if you don't know what it is. All right, and that's where you might have to do a little research, go online, and so on and so forth. Not necessarily with the basic, fundamental, simple properties, but maybe some of the more advanced ones. So, let's look at this drop-down conversion object, and let's look at the properties, and let's try to make an educated guess about which property it is. So, in IntelliSense, you click a dot, and it shows you a list of properties might be a little hard to read on the screen, but as you scroll down this list, it shows you in the tooltip a definition of what the property is. For example, access key is the first one. And an access key gets or sets the access key that allows you to quickly navigate to the web server control. In other words, you could make it so that they type in control C, it, took them, it would take them to the, um, um, take them to, to that, um, 
maybe control C wouldn't be a good idea, but you can you can create a key sequence that would take them to right into that box. All right, that has nothing to do with the with, with the with the value of that drop down. Append data bound items. Now, I don't even know what that means, so that's probably not it. Apply style. Now that's nothing to do with the style. Attributes. Now. Auto post back, we know what that is, and that's not what we're looking for. I'm not going to go through these exhaustively. I'm going to fast forward to three interesting ones. Select an index, select an item, and select a value. All right? Those sort of look like the suspects that we want to interrogate more closely. If we look at these, Selected index shows, uh, uh, returns the position of the item that was selected. So if I pick the first item in the drop down, that would have a value of zero. All right, if I pick the second item, it would have a value of one, and so on. Like with most things in, in programming, the, the numbering starts with zero. Selected item returns an actual item object. All right, what's an item object? We've actually seen item objects when we created the list of items that appear in the drop-down. So if we do select an item, that's going to return an object that has associated with it the va a value and the text and some other options as well. Well, we might be able to use either of these, but the clear winner is selected value. Selected value gets the value of the selected item on the list control. Well, that's what we want to do, right? We want to know what option the user picked. Now, do we want to know the text of that? No. We want to know the value because the value is what we used in scripts. So, I will say selected value. If that selected value equals F to C, Then we want to do the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. Otherwise, we want to do the centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion. Now, I could have said if drop-down conversion selected index equals zero. All right, and it would have done the same thing. But I like this one better. Why do you suppose I like this one better? Easier to understand. In case somebody switches the location. Yeah, it's easier to understand and in case someone switches that. Selected index equals zero isn't really descriptive, so you're, you're right in that regard. And also, what if someone decides, you know what, we do more centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion, so I'll make that the top one on the list. And all of a sudden, my code would break. All right? This is a, a more logical way of doing it. So let's see if it works, though. So, Fahrenheit to centigrade, I'll put in 212... Fahrenheit, that should be 100 centigrade, which it is. Let me put in 0 centigrade and convert to Fahrenheit, and it, it works as well. So we're in business, all right, and we have the drop-down working. Now, a couple things that we said we are going to do. Um, we could format that uh, output. Actually, I'm going to skip that part. That's pretty straightforward, not very exciting. You know, if, if you need to output it, you can. what you can do is you can concatenate strings together to say the answer is, you know, so many degrees Fahrenheit equals so many degrees centigrade. You could form a string and then put that string in the label. So that's not earth-shattering, all right? So we'll skip that, at least for today. Maybe, maybe we'll go back and do this on Tuesday. But the last thing I want to do is notice that The drop-down has only two options. So when I initially run this, it defaults to Fahrenheit to centigrade. Is that good? 